I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers. I want to thank you for being with us today on this program dealing with a subject called uh, Islam. You may have heard of that subject. It's a fairly big subject and it uh, affects a lot of people. And because of that, we decided we wanted to uh, deal with a subject that does affect a lot of people. And many people have a question about that. This is show number nine in this particular series that we're doing on this subject entitled Answering Islamic Apologists. Now, an apologist is not somebody that is apologizing for anything. An apologist is someone who has a set religious uh, position, a religion per, uh, particularly, that he thinks is correct, is right. And he's going to proclaim that as being right using uh, philosophy, arguments of logic, of uh, evidences that he might have to support his contention that his religion is true. At the same time, he will attack other religions that... Uh, purport to be true that would negate his religion. So uh, an apologist basically is one who claims his religion is true. He will defend his religion against other attacks and at the same time show why other religions can't be true in light of his religion. So he's sort of like a warrior, you might say. And in this case, the, the series is dealing with Islamic apologists who uh, defend their Islamic faith, but at the same time they're attacking other people's religions, particularly the Christian religion. Now, fortunately, in the Christian religion, you're called to be a Christian apologist. <laughs> so, uh, according to Jude 3, earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. It says to give to every man an answer for the hope that lies within you. That's 1 Peter 3.15, Philippians chapter 1, verses 7 and 17. It says uh, to be set for the defense and confirmation of the gospel. So, you, you can't go into this thing with your eyes closed. As a Christian, you should be ready to give people reasonable answers for why you believe what you believe. You should be ready to earnestly contend for your faith to show why it's true and why it will stand up to uh, reality. Can it, can it uh, survive the test of time and reality? Is it really true? If it's a lie, it'll be exposed as such. Uh, now, there's a lot of religions that have been around for a long time, but when you actually analyze their inner teachings and beliefs, I think the reality of the situation shows whether it's really true or it's just something of a wishful thinking of people that partake or participate in that religion. We want something that really ties to reality, not just wishful thinking of people who want to hold to a religion that may or may not have, well, actually, that may not have at all any real evidence going for it. They simply want to believe it because they want to believe it. And uh, joining me on this is Dr. Ja Jamal Badawi, <laughs> who, uh, who uh, we've been, he's been our main focus of this series. He's an Islamic apologist. He's the number one Islamic apologist in the, on the North American continent. He's uh, from the Islamic Information Center, headquartered out of, Cal uh, out of uh, Canada. And this particular series we've been analyzing is from his series of interviews on Islamic teachings about uh, Jesus the Beloved Messenger of Allah, Part 2, from his package 9 set. And in here, of course, he has his soundtracks, audio cassette soundtracks, of all his uh, television shows that he's done that have been seen by who knows how many thousands of people. And from show to show in our series, we've been trying to answer the claims and the accusations that Dr. Badawi has made, either for his Islamic faith or against the Christian faith. And from a Christian perspective, we're trying to answer his arguments on, on why we believe from his pers Islamic perspective uh, that his perspective is not correct and ours is right. It's the age-old argument that's been going down through the centuries. But we as Christians believe we have the right to answer the accusations made by Dr. Badawi and others against the Christian faith uh, because on these tapes he says the Christian faith is untrue and so forth and so on. But anyway, joining me on our show is my special guest, our Director of Research for Christian Answers, Steve Morrison. Great to have you here, Steve. Well, thank you, Larry. It's been a, a rough ride, but at the same time, I think it's been a benefit to our viewers who are able to contrast the pros and cons of Islam versus Christianity, because these two religions do not at all worship the same God, you know, in contrast to common belief. They worship two different deities and they have totally different beliefs. And even the Muslim apologists who we're at, in an adversarial role with would agree with us on that. Well, let's go on to the next tape. Tape number eight. Here it's Crucifixion 6 and 7. 
A. Badawi says if something is from God, it must not have contradictions. B. Badawi says the New Testament was written around the year 50 A.D. C. Badawi admits that the four canonized gospels speak of the crucifixion, but he says the gospel stories are not uh, consistent or authentic. D. Badawi quotes what he calls many biblical scholars, end quote, who attack the authenticity of the Bible. It says Mark and Luke were not eyewitnesses, and Matthew and John were really not written by the actual disciples. He uh, quotes people like uh, Dennis Meinham and John Fenton again. Point D E, as uh, Badawi attacks the Bible, he continually refers to Christians as brethren. So our brethren Christians. It's sort of like me, uh, you know, uh, you know, oh brother, and I've got a dagger in my hand, you know, I'm getting ready to stab you in the back when I say, you know, I have a smiley face and you know, I'll stab you in the back or I'll talk about you when I leave. But anyway, uh, F, Badaway says the story of crucifixion in the Gospels is inconsistent. G, Badaway says the Gospels are not authentic because of differing versions or accounts in the Gospels relating to, one, the anointing of Jesus, two, the events of the Last Supper, three, the last night and arrest of Jesus, four, trial of Jesus, five, crucifixion, six, burial, seven, what happened to Judas, and eight, resurrection. Something from God must not have contradictions. We agree with Badawi that truth is not contradictory. However, what is Dr. Badawi to make of the many abrogated verses in the Quran? Around 200 verses are considered by various Muslims to be abrogated. The Sahih Muslim Hadith records surahs that were taken out of the Quran. Even the non-abrogated parts contain many contradictions and inconsistencies. For example, Zul Karnayim did not discover the truth that the sun sets in a muddy spring in Surah 18, 85 through 86. The Quran says the earth was made in six days in Surah 754, Surah 10, 3, 11, 7, 25, 29, yet it took eight days in Surah 41, 9 through 12. Abrogation of verses is spoken of in Surah 2, 106, as well as Sahih Muslim 1, 1433, page 330. Abraham was the first to believe in Surah 614, yet it was Moses who was the first to believe, according to Surah 7, 143. The worldwide flood of Noah could not have taken place in Moses' time. Despite what Surah 7, 136 and 7, 59 and following say, we could go on with Surah 17, verse 1 and more, but suffice it to say that the Quran fails Badawi's test for authenticity based on contradictions. Dr. Badawi says the New Testament was written approximately 50 A.D., we do not know precisely the years various parts were written, but Badawi is correct here for Paul's letters, with the Gospels probably being slightly later. Badawi admits the four Gospel accounts refer to the crucifixion, but he claims they are not consistent or authentic. Badawi cannot escape the overwhelming evidence found in the Gospel accounts for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Early church history secular historians, archaeology, Jewish accounts, and other evidences testified to the validity of the crucifixion. Rather than deal with the facts readily available, Badawi simply turns a blind eye and claims these facts are not consistent or authentic based on his personal religious beliefs rather than objective investigation. Quoting non-Christians as Christians and Bible scholars. Badawi seems fond of quoting non-Christians as Christians or Bible scholars as he does in many of his recorded messages. We acknowledge that a non-Christian can be a Bible scholar, but Dr. Badawi should point out that they are not Christians rather than letting the listener assume that they are. However, Badawi has consistently blurred the issue here by calling anyone a Christian despite what their personal theological views may be. Christians are Badawi's brethren? 
Badawi likes to refer to Christians as brethren while at the same time attacking everything that a true Bible-believing Christian would believe. Badawi is simply giving lip service to Christians who may be listening to his programs in order to set them at ease as he feeds them his line of theological arsenic for the soul. This Badawi technique is of course rejected by Jesus Christ himself when he told the Jewish religious leaders that they were, quote, of their father the devil, end quote, John 8, 44. Simply having a religion by whatever name does not make you a, quote, brother, end quote. Consistency of the Crucifixion Badawi denies the biblical account of Christ's crucifixion based solely on his own definition of consistency. It is easy for atheists, for example, to define God out of existence in their literature by simply stating what they call, quote, natural laws, end quote, that do not allow for a God. Badawi here follows the atheist model by simply defining Christ's crucifixion out of existence by his own man-made set of consistency laws. Anointing of Jesus In Bethany, six days before Passover, Jesus attends a feast at Simon the leper's house in his honor, where Mary served. Jesus is anointed for the second time by Mary with a pint of nard worth a year's wages from an alabaster jar. Note that this is the town where Lazarus lived, not the house. Judas Iscariot and the disciples complain. Matthew 26, 6 through 13. Mark 14, 3 through 9. John 12, 1 through 11. Judas talks with priests. Matthew 26, 14 through 16. Mark chapter 14, verses 10 through 11. Luke 22, 3 through 6. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Thursday, they prepared the Last Supper. Matthew 26, 17 through 19. Mark 14, 12 through 16. Luke 22, 7 through 13. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. John 13, 1 through 18. Events of the Last Supper. In a large upper room, Mark 14, 15, they partake of the Lord's Supper. Matthew 26, 20 through 29. Mark 14, 17 through 25. Luke 22, 14 through 23. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. Jesus says Judas will betray him. John 13, verses 18 through 28a. Jesus' new command to love one another. John 13, 31 through 35. In the midst of the Last Supper, Judas leaves. John 13, verse 28b through 30. Either at the Last Supper or shortly thereafter. Another argument over who is greatest. That's Luke 22. 24 through 30. Last night and arrest. After Judas left, en route to the Mount of Olives, Jesus predicts Peter will deny him three times. Matthew 26, 30 through 35. Mark 14, 26 through 31. Luke 22, 31 through 38. John 13, 36 through 38. In the Garden of Gethsemane, on the Mount of Olives, Matthew 26, 36 through 46, Mark 14, 32 through 43a, Luke 22, 39 through 46. From the Last Supper to the Mount of Olives, Jesus speaks. John chapter 14, verse 1 through John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus' pre-arrest prayer, John 17, verses 1 through 26. After Jesus finishes praying, they cross the Kidron Valley and go into an olive grove. John 18, verse 1. Trial of Jesus. Arrest of Jesus. Matthew 26, 47 through 56. Mark 14, 43b through 52. Luke 22, 47 through 53. John chapter 18, verses 2 through 11. In or near the courtyard of the high priest, Jesus is tried by the Sanhedrin. 
Matthew 26, 57 through 68, Mark 14, 53 through 65, Luke 22, 66 through 71, John 18, 12 through 14, John 18, 19 through 23. In the courtyard, Peter denies Christ three times. Matthew 26, 69 through 75, Mark 14, 66 through 72, Luke 22, 54 through 62, John 18, 15 through 18, John 18, 25 through 27. Crucifixion. Soldiers mock, beat, and blindfold Jesus. Luke 22, 63 through 65. Jesus' trial before Pilate. Matthew 27, 11 through 14, Mark 15, 1 through 15, Luke 23, 1 through 6, John 18, 28 through 37. Jesus sent to Herod, Luke 23, verses 7 through 11a. Jesus sent back to Pilate, Luke 23, 11b through 12. Pilate appeals to the crowd and releases Barabbas, Matthew 27, 15 through 26, Luke 23, 13 through 25, John 18, 38 through 40. Roman soldiers flogged Jesus and put on him purple scarlet robe and crown of thorns, Matthew 27, 27 through 31a, Mark 15, 16 through 20a, and John 19, 1 through 3. Pilate goes out to the Jews again, John 19, verses 4 through 15. Jesus is led away to be crucified, Matthew 27, 31b, Mark 15, verse 20b, Luke 23, verse 26a, John 19, verse 16. Jesus, at first, carried his own cross. That's John 19, 17a. Simon, then, is made to carry Jesus' cross. That's Matthew 27, verse 32, Mark 15, 21, Luke 23, 26b. Jesus says, quote, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children, end quote. Luke 23, 28 through 31. On Golgotha, on the third hour, 9 a.m., Jesus is crucified. Matthew 27, 33. Mark 15, 22, 25. Luke 23, 33. John 19, 16 B through 22. Trilingual sign above Jesus' head. Matthew 27, 37. Mark 15, 26. Luke 23, 38. Two criminals are crucified alongside of Jesus. Matthew 27, 38. Mark 15, 27. Luke 23, 32 through 33. Jesus says, quote, Father, forgive them, end quote. Luke 23, 34a. Some offer Jesus drink, but he refuses. Matthew 27, 34. Mark 15, 23. Roman soldiers cast lots for Jesus' clothes. Matthew 27, 35 through 36. Mark 15, 24. Luke 23, 34b. John 10, 23 through 24. Jesus said, quote, Woman, here is your son. Son, here is your mother. End quote. John 19, 25 through 27. Others say, quote, He saved others. Let him save himself. End quote. Matthew 27, 40 through 43, Mark 15, 29 through 30, Luke 23, verse 35a. Priests mock Jesus, Mark 15, 31 through 32, Luke 23, 35b. Soldiers mock Jesus on the cross, Luke 23, 36 through 37. Thief on the left insults Jesus, Matthew 27, verse 44. Luke 23, verse 39. Thief on the right defends Jesus. Luke 23, verses 40 through 43a. Jesus says to one of the thieves, quote, Today you will be with me in paradise. End quote. Luke 23, verse 43b. Jesus says, quote, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? End quote. Matthew 27, 45 through 47. Mark 15, 34 through 36. Jesus says, quote, 
I am thirsty, end quote, and again is offered drink from a sponge. Matthew twenty seven forty eight. John nineteen twenty eight through twenty nine. Some wait to see if Elijah comes. Matthew twenty seven forty nine. From about the sixth to the ninth hour, the sun stops shining. Mark fifteen thirty three. Luke twenty three forty four through forty five. Jesus says, quote, it is finished, end quote, John 19, 30. Right before dying, Jesus says, quote, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, end quote. Luke 23, verse 46a, Jesus dies. Matthew 27, verse 50, Mark 15, 37, Luke 23, 46b, temple curtain was torn in two. Matthew 27, verse 51a. Mark 15, 38 and 39. Earthquake occurred. Tombs broke open and dead people appear. Matthew 27, 51 B through 53. Soldiers break thieves' legs, but not Jesus's. John 19, verses 31 through 37. Centurion says, quote, Surely this was a righteous man, end quote. Luke 23, 47 through 49. Centurion says, quote, this was the Son of God, end quote. Matthew 27, verse 54. Many women were watching. Matthew 27, 55 through 56. As evening came, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Matthew 27, verses 57 and 58. John 19, 38. In the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, Joseph and Nicodemus bury Christ's body, and a stone is rolled over the tomb. Matthew 27, 59 through 61, Mark 15, 42 through 47, Luke 23, 50 through 54, John 19, 39 through 42. Before the Sabbath, the women get spices to anoint Jesus' body. Luke 23, 55 through 56. Pilate agrees to a guard of soldiers at the tomb. Matthew 27, 62 through 65. Romans put a seal on the tomb and post a guard. Matthew 27, verse 66. What happened to Judas? Judas is seized with remorse when he sees Jesus is condemned to death after Judas's betrayal. Matthew 27, verse 3. At Akeldama, Judas goes out and hangs himself. Matthew 27, verses 1 through 10, and Acts chapter 1, verses 18 through 19. Note, critics of the Bible often use Judas' death to declare that a contradiction exists between the two gospel accounts, Badawi being no exception. The two accounts are not contradictory, but rather mutually complementary. Judas hangs himself, just as Matthew reports, while the account in Acts simply adds the fact that Judas' body fell, probably from the K, and busted open with his intestines gushing out against the rocks below. Muslim attacks against the scriptures are similar to this example in every case in spite of reasonable explanations to the contrary. Resurrection. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, the mother of James, Salome, and the women start to travel to the tomb. Matthew 28, 1b, Mark 16, 1 through 3, Luke 24, verse 1, John 20, verse 1. There is an earthquake and an angel moves away the stone. Roman guards become like dead men. Matthew 28. Verses 2 through 4, Mark 16, verse 4, Luke 24, verse 2. Jesus' body is not found, and two men, angels, speak to the women. Luke 24, verses 3 through 8, John 20, verse 2. The morning that Jesus rose, an angel appears to the women and tells them to tell the disciples to go to Galilee, Matthew 28, Verses 5 through 7, Mark 16, 5 through 8. While the women were hurrying back, Jesus also appears to the women and tells them to tell the disciples to go to Galilee. Matthew 28, 
8 through 10. When the women return from the tomb, the disciples do not believe them. Luke 24, 9 through 11. Peter and John run to the tomb. John gets there first. Luke 24, verse 12. John 20, verses 3 through 9. Then the disciples return to their homes in Jerusalem. John 20, verse 10. The Roman guards tell the Jewish priests that Jesus' tomb is empty. The priests bribe the guards not to tell what actually happened at the tomb. Matthew 28, 11 through 15. As she wept, two men and then Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. Mark 16, 9 through 11, John 20, 11 through 18. The same day on the road to Emmaus, Jesus appears to two disciples, not of the eleven disciples. He stays with them until evening. Mark 16, verse 12, Luke 24, 13 through 29. Immediately, the two disciples rush back to Jerusalem, seven miles away, and tell the eleven disciples, Mark 16, 13, Luke 24, 33 through 35. In Jerusalem, the evening of the same day that Jesus rose, while the two are talking to the disciples, Jesus appears the first time to ten of the original eleven disciples, John 20, 19 through 23. Other disciples tell Thomas, the eleventh disciple, they have seen Jesus, John 20, verse 25. Then Jesus appears to doubting Thomas, whereupon Thomas declares unto Jesus that Jesus is Thomas's, quote, Lord and God, end quote, John 20, verse 28. The conclusion to this matter. Badawi says the Gospels are not authentic because of differing versions or accounts in the Gospels. However, viewers can see by the previous charts that this is simply not the case. Badawi, because he is following the false prophet Muhammad, refuses to believe the Gospel accounts no matter what and without sufficient evidence. Badawi's prior theological commitment to Muslim mythology clouds any objective judgment he may have had towards the biblical records. But you see his argument. He's saying that because they don't exactly agree on every point, these are contradictions mm -hmm. and show that it's not divine and therefore can't be trusted. And yet, you know, it's like in a court of law, the rules of evidence in a court of law. You bring in five or six witnesses and... These may be people that were actually at the scene of the crowd. Let's say they were in a traffic accident, and they were all really there. But when you get their testimony about what happened, they won't exactly say the exact same thing the other guy said because they may not have uh, noticed every last little detail about mm -hmm. the, the car accident, let's say. But does that mean that their testimony in the court is invalid because this witness didn't say exactly the same thing this one over here said on every point? Yeah. Now, now, it was contradictory, it's one thing, but, but if one guy said he was hit by a car and some guy said he was hit by a red car, you don't throw out their testimony. Right, right. And as you just said, when you, these things that Battleway brings up as contradictions are not contradictions at all. He, these just simply show that the story has more to it than he's giving it credit for. He's limiting the ability of the writers to express themselves the way it was meant to be. He wants to press his interpretation on top of what the gospel accounts say and just any little thing that he says, oh, he, he left out this part that this other guy mentioned. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's a contradiction, and, 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 and that shows this, these guys aren't of God. This couldn't be the word of God. See, you don't do that in the court of law, and you can't do that here either. And we don't take that and do that to the Quran. You know, mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if one passage says uh, one thing that's similar to another passage that says something, and yet it doesn't say quite everything that the other passage said we've already brought out, there's a couple of surahs in there that talk about killing children. And they kind of reverse the words around in the Quran. And I think one's in Surah 6 and the other one's in Surah 17. And uh, if you look at that passage there about killing children, the words are reversed a little bit. And in one uh, of the surahs, he gives a little more information than he does in the other surah. One, one of those surahs that talk about killing children is like twice as long as the other one 
which is talking about the same thing, but it's only half as big. Right. So are, are these two surahs then uh, contradictory and invalid because they, one doesn't have as much information as the other? Yeah, we're talking and, about the same thing. And by the context, is killing children is wrong. It's not advocating killing right, children. Right, right. So uh, that was just an example we can use just from the Quran. But his standard, he won't dare use that against the Quran because then his standard would destroy his own book right. and he won't do that. But he'll do it against the Bible, which I, I think is disingenuous. But let's, uh, let's, let's turn it around on Dr. Battle here and let him ex defend his own book. Uh, have you. Uh, have you uh, seen any contradictions, or at least what might be construed as contradictions, in the Quran? Oh, sure. There, there, there are a number of things, and we don't have time to do all of them here, but just to do, to do a few. In Surah 4, 11 and 12, and Surah 4, 178, they state the law about inheritance. 176. 176. So, so in other words, if a man wants to just have um, you know, equal inheritance for all his children, uh, you know, he can't do it. All right, he's supposed to follow this. For example, in this case, it says if he has three daughters... Uh, to his two parents and his wife, then they'll have two thirds for the three daughters together, and one third for the parents together, and then one eighth for the wife. Okay, well, well, that's more than three thirds. It's three thirds plus an eighth. Or in another example, if a man has only his mother, his wife, and two sisters, and they receive one third, and then the wife has a fourth, and then two thirds for the two sisters, and a third for the mother, that again add, 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 adds up to, to basically one, one and a fourth. Um, so it, these things don't quite match together with with all the the things. What about abrogation in the Quran? Well, abrogation is sort of an, an interesting thing. First of all, we have to say, you know, who has the right to abrogate? Does anybody have the right to do that? And it says there is none who can change Allah's words. You know, Surah six uh, one fifteen, also in Surah six thirty four and ten sixty five. Okay, and so if no one can change Allah's, has permission to change Allah's words, except perhaps Allah, then how come surahs were exchanged for better ones, like in 2106 and 16101? And how come uh, most, most Muslims, they will have certain verses and surahs in the Quran where they will tell you that these are abrogated today, and there is no word from Allah that it was abrogated today. So right. they're saying that without authority. So they are changing... Um, you know, all those words and saying what's abrogated or not, while the surah says that none's supposed to change it. And of course, they also have that problem with the, uh, the surah 53 with the abrogated verses about the three uh, daughters of Allah, Alat, Aluza, and Manat. And we did an entire one hour show on that called The Daughters of Allah, right? Uh, otherwise known as the uh, Satanic Verses. And, uh, the original Satanic exactly, Verses. Yeah, not exactly. Rushes. And this is where you have Muhammad speaking, with, you know for the devil, basically, and saying it's from God. But these are all problems that uh, the Muslims have to deal with, and it's established in Islamic history. Uh, we don't have to make this up. We can just go to the Muslim sources to get those references. This isn't some kind of Christian uh, chicanery here to discredit their religion. We get this information straight from um, Islamic sources. Well, you, do you have any others that you'd like well, to share? Well, another one, uh, what is the punishment for adultery? Well, in Surah 24.2, it says the woman and the man guilty of fornication, it says flog each of them with a hundred stripes. Okay, so notice as the flogging, notice that the man and woman receive equal punishment. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the Bible, by the way, the, the, the man, the, a man and woman, if there's no coercion, they, they will receive equal punishment too. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, but then uh, for the men it says, if they repent and amend, leave them alone in Surah 4.16. Okay. However, if we turn to Surah 24.2, uh, that, sort of, uh, that seems like a, uh, uh, you know, it's like it doesn't say anything about leaving the woman alone. Uh, you know, it says flogging them both equally. To reiterate, notice from the Quran, Surah 4.15, it says, confine them to houses until death do claim them. That meaning lifelong house arrest for women. But the punishment for men is different. Quote, if they repent and amend, leave them alone, end quote, from Surah 4.16. So there's a vast difference in punishment between Surah 4.15 and Surah 4.16. The difference between women and men, not to mention the contradiction with Surah 24.2. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like, you know, in a lot of Muslim society, if there is a, a woman who is a loose woman, 
you know, she would definitely be punished severely. Uh, but if there's a man, you know, especially if it were a rich man and he wants to go on some sort of, um, you know, trip and, 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 and have women who aren't his, his wives uh, mm -hmm. and have sex with them, uh, you know, well, as long as he says he repents, is that okay? Uh, I, I mean, I haven't heard, heard of a particular Muslim at, uh, at uh, University of North Texas. You know, he would go and he would visit prostitutes. And uh, Christian asked him about that, why he would do that and still be a Muslim. And he said, well, they weren't Muslim women. Mm -hmm. You know, now that's not standard Muslim teaching. That's a rationalization of Muslim teaching. But it seems like this rationalization has kind of, you know, slipped in too. It says they're equal, uh, and and yet in the Quran, you're, you, you know, you can you know leave the man alone if he makes a mess. And what I think too is interesting about that is in Islamic tradition, going through the Hadith uh, throughout them, Al Bukhari said Muslim and the rest of them. Uh, you have the fact that those traditions, those Islamic traditions, which uh, many Sunni Muslims really have high respect for, right. say you're to stone, stone to death these adulterers. Which contradicts the Quran. Which contradicts the, exactly, which contradicts the the, the uh, flogging thing, and we've given the references to that before. But you can definitely look that up yourselves. Check those hadiths out, and you'll see. But uh, I've got Ibn's Ibn's Haq. His book, the very earliest biography and a collection of the traditions of the life of Muhammad in biographical form, page 684, talking about Uma speaking, they get right into this from the Hadith and things, uh, where they talk about how this, this idea of stoning adulterers was a big law and rule of Muhammad, and he taught how to do it in the ritual and everything, and uh, he was concerned that they had left it out of the Quran. And this is coming right out, I'm not making this up, this came right out of the, the Islamic tra traditions. So, Check into that too, but you find their own traditions contradict their holy Bible, right? Or Quran and, and, and of in this course, case. Shiites would kind of say amen to that because you know, <laughs> they don't accept all of those anyway. That's right. That's right. But anyway, we're already through tape number eleven of this series that I just showed you, uh, and basically, Badawi has been showing that the Bible's not true. That you know the accounts. Uh, given are, are wrong, or, or John was written by somebody else. Uh, Matthew didn't write Matthew, and Matthew, whoever wrote it, made a lot of mistakes, and they messed up on prophecy. And and uh, Paul was distressed by uh, mental distress when he became a Christian, and he wanted to be kind of the big gun, so he got rid of Barnabas so he could tell it like it is, and he made up a bunch of innovations and falsehoods. But Paul ends up getting to write 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament uh, with a bunch of myths and fables. And where did he get those myths, myths and fables from? He got them from, according to Badawi, the, the Muslim apologist, he got them from Greek philosophy. He got it from ancient pagan religions and, and tribal religions. And basically what these Christian writers are trying to pawn off on us here in the New Testament is a sort of like a tribal god that came to us from myths and legends. And uh, as, as, we, as I said, we've already gone through three albums of Dr. Battleway. They're all, they're all behind me back here. I've got three of these albums that we've dealt with. And uh, this is a, the final album. As you can see here on the table, we dealt with this package six. We dealt with this package eight. And we dealt now here with this package nine. Uh, that's 48 hours of material. And of which I've listened to a lot of these tapes twice over, so that puts me up there in listening to these things, uh, way up in, in the numbers. But and also read his literature, like Dr. Badawi's Muhammad in the Bible. We've already dealt with this. But uh, to make a long story short, we're now down to tape 12, his last few tapes in his final album, tapes 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. Because of the lack of time, we are condensing the final tapes in Badawi's album, tapes 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, will be presented in a concise manner in the following presentation. Tape 12, Roots of God Incarnate, parts 3 and 4. A. Badawi admits that the Gospels teach what they teach, but he says these come from myths. B. Badawi offers the Samaritan theory, which states that the Samaritans did not believe in anything in the Bible past Joshua and were under the influence of various pagan beliefs. The so-called writers of the Gospels were under the Samaritan influence, which also had ties to belief systems associated with the occultist Simon Magus, mentioned in Acts chapter 8, 
verses 9 through 25. Point C. Badawi clearly admits that the New Testament is teaching on many things, crucifixion, resurrection, Jesus being, quote, the Son of God, end quote, Jesus being God, etc., but he does not believe any of it. Point D. He admits that he must assume the Bible is false if the Quran is to be considered true. The Gospel versus Myths Similar myths have been found for some of the stories in the Quran, such as Jesus speaking as a baby. Badawi needs to find examples, not of myths, but of myths that were before the similar part of the New or Old Testament was written, even where there are myths with similarities, such as a worldwide flood. One would expect people to come up with stories to try to explain cataclysmic events. Evidence for the allegedly widespread use of the Greek word kurios as a title for the pagan gods of the Hellenistic age is spotty at best. See Martin Hingle's book, Son of God, page 77. For another example, there is no evidence to support belief in the existence of a pagan kurios cult in either Antioch or Damascus. And finally, there is no evidence to support the claim that the Christianity Paul found in Damascus and Antioch was radically different from that of the Christian church in Jerusalem. Samaritans and Sadducees, religious liberals, did not accept the writings of the prophets, such as Isaiah, David, Solomon, etc. Badawi failed to establish how the gospel writers were influenced in any way by Samaritans. He mentions Simon Magus, presumably because he is a Samaritan, but does not tie this into anything the gospel writers, or for that matter, Muhammad, said. This is simply wishful thinking on Badawi's part. Badawi admits what the New Testament teaches, but he does not believe it. He does not believe it because of, quote, prior theological commitment, end quote, to the Quran and the Islamic culture Badawi was brought up in since his childhood in Egypt. Badawi admits that the Bible must be false if the Quran is true. This is a very important point. Having read the Bible as much as Badawi apparently has, he agrees that if the Bible is from God, and its message was preserved without significant corruption, then the Quran must be false. Obviously, Badawi is forced to believe that the Bible has to be positively and absolutely corrupt for there to be any possibility that the Quran is true. Tape 13, Roots of God Incarnate A. Badawi says historic Christian doctrines were plausible in ancient times, but not now. B. Badawi says Simon Magus of Acts chapter 8, a Samaritan, introduced incarnational theology into Christianity. C. Badawi offers up more theories about the roots of Christianity, such as, quote, divine men, end quote, and, quote, ruler cults, end quote, going on about the same time as the start of Christianity. Badawi says the New Testament writers simply bought into this idea of Jesus being a, quote, God-man, end quote. Badawi's logic tells him, therefore, the New Testament writers are guilty by association and time frame of these events. Historic Christian doctrines only plausible in ancient times? In English, there is a slang expression to describe Dr. Badawi's opinion. This is like the pot calling the kettle black. Badawi accepts the Hadith as being authoritative. The Hadith speak of Muhammad splitting the moon in two, Gabriel physically hurting Muhammad, Muhammad being bewitched, and there being abrogated surahs in the Quran. Liberals who deny historic Christian doctrines typically deny the virgin birth and sinlessness of Christ, yet Badawi accepts those things, as well as the fact that Jesus performed 
many miracles. In fact, it is not the miracles of Jesus' battle we objects to, so much as the crucifixion, resurrection, the Trinity, and Jesus being called God. Badawi lives by the rule of the, quote, double standard, end quote. It was Simon Magus who introduced incarnational theology? That is just as ludicrous as saying Dr. Badawi told Muhammad what to put in the Quran. Most of the apostles never met Simon Magus, and Jesus accepted worship as God and was called God prior to Simon Magus. Dr. Badawi needs to do better than to just go fishing for objections with a total lack of evidence. There are a number of things that one can say about Dr. Badawi's theories concerning Simon Magus. The difficulty is not that we know so much, but that we know so much that isn't so. That's a quote from Mark Twain. Quote, as scarce as truth is, the supply has always been in excess of demand, end quote, from Josh Billings. Quote, men readily believe what they want to believe. What we desire, we readily believe. And what we ourselves think, we expect others to think, end quote. That quote coming from Julius Caesar. Badawi's divine men and ruler cult theory. These Spurious theories by Badawi have already been dealt with in detail during this video series. However, for the benefit of the viewer, we will add the following. Claims that Pauline Christianity was derived from Hellenistic churches and pagan mystery cults is refuted by the fact that there is complete silence in the New Testament regarding any possible disagreement or conflict between Paul and and the Christian leaders, such as Peter, James, etc., of the Jerusalem church regarding their understanding of Jesus. Evidence indicates that those who first took the Christian gospel to Antioch were Jews of the dispersion who received their own understanding of Jesus from Jesus' closest followers, the apostles. It is incredible that such men would so soon forget the impression that they had received and then emulate pagan cults instead. The religion of the New Testament is totally alien to any spirit of compromise or cooperation with anything that might undermine the supremacy of Christ. Badawi's criteria for accusing the Bible could just as easily be used against his own Quran. Theories without facts are always a useful methodology for anyone that is not really interested in the truth. Thus, Meyer's Law, cited by C.L. Salzberger in the New York Times, August 20, 1969, applies to Badawi here. Quote, if the facts don't fit the theory, discard the facts. Badawi's Tape 14, Roots of God Incarnate, 7 and 8. A. Badawi loves to say, quote, some scholars say, end quote, and then he tries to construe from this that Christianity is based on Greek and Hellenistic sources going from Philo to Paul, especially tying this in with the Greek word logos. B. Badawi tries to tie heretical teachings from the book of Enoch to biblical writings. C. Badawi calls Herbert W. Armstrong a scholar and says Jesus was just a man, quoting Surah 9.30. D. He also mentions pagan origins of Christmas and Easter. Badawi, the Logos, and the Word of God. The Logos, mediator of Hebrews, is not Philo's metaphysical abstraction, but a specific, individual, historical person, Jesus Christ. Philo's philosophical system is totally incompatible with the notion of the Incarnation. Philo's logos could never be described as Hebrews pictures Jesus as suffering, being tempted to sin, or dying. By the way, Badawi in his zeal to accuse Christianity apparently forgot that the Quran also says Jesus is Allah's word, 
logos meaning word. The Book of Enoch and the Bible. The non-canonical Book of Enoch is a composite book with five different sections, probably by different authors. Anyone can write a book of falsehood and put in a few verses of the Bible to make it appear credible. Joseph Smith Jr.'s Book of Mormon is a classic example. Badawi scrapes up any dubious literature he can find to attempt to prop up his hollow arguments and theories. Herbert W. Armstrong again. Badawi is rehashing his mention of Herbert W. Armstrong in Badawi's Package 8, Tape 1. Badawi calls Herbert W. Armstrong a, quote, Christian scholar, end quote. Badawi forgets to mention that Armstrong was a heretic who claimed that he, Armstrong, was God as part of the God family. Armstrong began his cultic church in 1934, and he published a magazine called The Plain Truth. If Armstrong was a Christian by Badawi's standards, then Badawi must admit that worshipers of Muhammad are true Muslims, just as Badawi considers himself to be. Christian Holidays Badawi cites Easter as a pagan rite with roots in Babylon and the goddess Astarte, with the word itself being derived from the Norse Ostara or Ostre. Badawi ties Christmas and the date December 25th with the ancient Roman holiday of Saturnalia, which involved tribute to the pagan god Saturn, the god of agriculture. Badawi fails to realize that old words can have new meanings and therefore no paganism is involved. Easter is celebrated by Christians as the resurrection of Christ, while Christmas is the celebration of Christ's birth. Christ alone is celebrated, not ancient deities. If Badawi follows his own logic in paganism avoidance, then he would refuse to use or honor calendars as well. Hypocritically, however, Badawi and other Muslims use calendars which have their origins in paganism. For example, Sunday, Sun's Day, the Sun God. Monday is named after Moon's Day, the Moon God. Tuesday, Mars, in Norse, Mars was known as Tues, that's Mars Day, Tuesday. Wednesday, Mercury's Day, also Wooden's Day. Thursday, Thor's, also known as Jupiter, Thor's Day. Friday, Venus's Day, also known as Frigga's Day. Saturday, Saturn's Day, Greek, Father of Zeus. January is named after the Roman god Janus, the deity of the gates. February is named after the Sabine festival of purification called Februa. March, named after the Roman god Mars, god of war. April, named after Aphrodite, also known as Venus, the goddess of love. Badawi's Tape 15, An Islamic Perspective on the Question of Mystery. A. Badawi says the Bible is wrong, and for Muslims, the truth is, 1. You cannot know that you are saved until the end. 2. You must attain salvation with Allah by good deeds, not just a faith in Jesus and salvation by grace as the Bible teaches, according to Badawi. 3. Allah does not forgive those who have, quote, partners, end quote, with God, or believe in the Trinity. Point B. Badawi says there are two conditions for salvation. One, you must have a right belief in God. In other words, quote, no partners with God, end quote. Two, you must have good deeds. Point C. Badawi says, quote, Muslims are not obsessed with sin and atonement like Christians. Badawi says you cannot know you are saved until the end. For Muslims, 
Even Mohammed trembled at the thought of his torment in the grave, according to Sahith Muslim 1, 1214, page 290. From the Islamic perspective, Badawi is correct. Since Islam is a religion manufactured by men to enable them to reach up to heaven, it only makes sense that men do not in themselves have confidence to attain this goal. This is in stark contrast to the Bible. Biblically speaking, God's children have God's promises that He will preserve them in His strength, not man's. See Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 39. Salvation in Islam is works and faith based. Muslims and people in other religions do good deeds in order to get saved by their own effort. People in various religions hope to be able to say to God, quote, I deserve to go to your heaven, end quote. Christians do good works not to get saved, but out of gratitude for God's effort in saving them. Biblically, Christians do not demand that God save them or that they work for salvation, but are grateful for God's grace and mercy in doing so. See Isaiah 64, 6, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, Romans 9, 11, Titus 3, 5, which says, quote, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his, that's God's, mercy, he, God, saved us. Allah and partners. Surah 9, 30 through 31 says, quote, God's curse be on them, how they are deluded away from the truth, far as he from having the partners they associate with him, end quote. Badawi follows the Quran here. Those who believe in the Trinity, Jesus being the Son of God, etc., are cursed of God. Therefore, Christians and others who believe these doctrines are doomed. Fortunately, the Bible totally disagrees with Badawi and his Islamic religion. The Bible states that those who repent and believe, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as both Lord and Savior, the Son of God, will be saved. See Acts 16.31, Acts 4.12, Hebrews 9.28, John 3.18 says, quote, He that believeth on him, Jesus, is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us. Be with us again next time.